We are good and live. Hey everybody, welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied voice, Justin. How are you all today? Happy Tuesday. I see we have peoples. Yes, yes, we have Rocktroll. He's almost done. He's so close. I should get my paint out while I'm talking to you guys. Hello, Cornico. It's good to see you again. Let's see here. We need some brown today for his little pelt thing, and I want to do... I loved the color I got on that bone of his, that bone canteen, so I want to work with that a bit. And let's see, we're using all of our happy little dungeon dweller paints to, to be a, do a Bob Ross for you. The happy little paint. Happy little paint. The Rocky Troll. And I've been thinking about his base, and I don't know if I'm going to rebase him on something bigger or if I'm just going to sculpt something on top of what he already has. Because, um, like, any bigger base that I try to fit him on is going to be, like, a really big base, and I don't really necessarily ah want to... Um, I don't want to have to fill all that space with stuff. So, like, when you guys are thinking about, um, like, how to base your, your model do consider the fact that you can't go too large with the base. Um, the more space you put down there, the more interesting stuff you need to put on there to make it look good. Otherwise, it's just the big blank, blaze, blank base of, of uh, atrocity. And <laughs> and any of us at Reaper, uh, ReaperCon, when we are judging your model, will kind of raise an eyebrow at you and go, couldn't you have done something? Um, I'm not going to pile rocks on there, no. I'm going to do probably... Uh, stalagmites and some pooled water just a little bit um I'll, I'll work with the texture that's on there mostly pendrake i just want a little bit of something um piling okay piling rocks on here even though he is a rock troll is really boring <laughs> when you are looking at basing materials try to switch it up try not to have all the same material on a base uh adding water is always a, a good thing because you're adding a different element then um likewise adding wood or, you know, trees, bushes, leaves, anything like that plant matter. Um, that's why that works so well, is you're adding a different sort of thing, a different element, so to speak. So when you are looking at interesting basing, try to do that sort of thing. Try to think outside of the box. Don't just pile rocks on it. Um, I mean, you could also do some crystals if you wanted to sculpt them, although they're a pain to sculpt. Uh, you'd probably want to use David's wood putty and just kind of slice them into shapes. But I think that would be pretty boring. I already have purple for one thing down here by his feet, and so I don't really need more purple on the base. It's the most saturated color on the model, and so it's going to distract if I put it there. So all of these things are something you need to think about when you're thinking about basing. Um, is like you don't you want the base to be interesting, but you don't want it to distract from the model. If at all possible, you want it to add to the story of the model. So you don't want to just throw, you know, something bland on there that doesn't matter. And you don't want to go off story. So like if he's in a cave, which I kind of was thinking is putting stalag stalagmites uh, and some water um, and making it kind of moist looking is a good idea. But just throwing like random battlefield debris on there isn't necessarily. So. So yeah, so those are all things that you think about and that I have been thinking about regarding his base. Um, like as I said, the advantage of not putting him on a bigger base and putting it in is that I don't have to fill more space. Putting a lot of uh, space on your base can be boring as blazes. So hey, we're doing a lot of alliterative and uh, uh, stuff like that today. Assonance, right? Is that the vowel? The repeated vowel sound is as assonance and assonance or assonance and then the... The repeated consonant is the alliteration. Uh, so we're doing a lot of verbal things, but that's mostly because I'm still asleep. <laughs> so, so those are all things you would think about on your basing. Um, 
in reality, I really, really love the way this uh, bone turned out, and I think I want to do the same thing on his loincloth and keep the do the brown around the uh, leather as I am and just highlight that today. We should be able to finish this out completely today. Um, I may go off off uh, color palette and make his eyes kind of a really bright red um, or orange because I want them to really stand out. That's why I underpainted them with white. I don't want to do glowing eyes because then I'll lose all this nice dark socket. And I think that the darkness of the socket is part of what makes him look menacing. So that's why I would not choose to do glowing eyes on this. Glowing eyes is cool on something if it adds to the effect. But here I'm not certain that it would. So that's not really what I'm going for. Uh, do, 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 do. Off work on 80% pay. More painting time. Yeah, that's a bummer about the shutdown, Kurniko. It's just like, man, you just hope that, that we get enough vaccine fast enough so that that stuff goes away. Look forward to the future. Plan a vacation for the fall. That's what David and I did yesterday. We finally locked down our dates for Hawaii. So we're like, all right, let's just, let's just pull the trigger. Uh, so we actually booked um, at the end of September, early October. So then uh, that'll, that'll hopefully go through. Hopefully, we're hoping by the end of September, we will have vaccinations. <laughs> we're gambling. We're, we're rolling the dice on it. Uh, but that's the plan. That's the plan right now. Yes, I love Hawaii, Chibi. So I decided if we were going to take a big vacation this year, I decided I want to do that. Next year is probably Europe, but we'll see. Yeah. Hi, Coops. How's it going? So what was I going to grab? I was going to grab... No, I think I'm good. I've got everything. I had a moment where I was like, maybe I should grab that thing from my cabinet. And then I was like, no. All right. So let's troll. Let's let's troll each other. Let's troll. I'm going to troll you. I'm sorry. Never been want to go? Totally should go, Chibi. I personally love Oahu. That's the, my, I, I went to the Big Island with my parents, so David and I are going back to the Big Island this time, and we'll probably, we have enough time to kind of branch out and, and uh, go around on the islands, but I personally love Oahu, and uh, so hopefully we'll get back there at some point too, but mostly we're going to go and enjoy the awesome scenery and hike a bit and uh, go to amazing restaurants, and David wants to see a volcano. So somehow we have to figure out what volcano tours are available and how dangerous we want to be. I would like to see a volcano too in real life. That would be pretty cool. As long as it wasn't erupting at me, right? All right, let's mix up our brown. Ah, Disney World. Yeah, Hawaii is beautiful. And, and just, it's just an awesome place. I don't know. Their public transport system is, a, is really well run in general. So you can get everywhere by bus and uh, it's, you don't really even need, although they have Uber, but it, you don't really need it. Um, they, uh, they have really good um, transportation systems within the island. At least on Oahu they do. It's one of the, like apparently Hawaii has the number one rated public transport system in the nation. Um, so it makes it really easy to get around if you don't mind waiting around for a bus here and there. Uh, <laughs> Kilauea has just refilled its lava lake. <laughs> Volcanoes for the win. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I've been to Kauai when I was there with my family years and years and years ago. It would have been like the end of my high school. Um, we did, uh, Maui and Kauai and the, just a tiny bit of Big Island. Like we kind of passed through Big Island on our way to Maui. Um, and, uh, then when I went myself a couple years ago, I went to, uh, Oahu and Honolulu, um, and that I, I just loved it. And I didn't even get to do everything on Oahu that I wanted to do. So I totally want to go back there. Um, I'm doing two drops of orange, by the way, goblin skin and two drops of our dungeon gray. And then I'm going to tune it, tune it to being a brown. Uh, but yeah, that's true. That's true. Telescopes. I hadn't thought about that. David's interested in that too. Great, great suggestion, Chibi. Remind me of that if I forget. Um, but yeah, so yeah, yeah. See, my my family's my parents' fiftieth wedding anniversary got canned in 2020. So my dad wants to do the Alaska cruise still. And now that Kiri is gone, I might be able to. But I don't know if I want to gamble on it. That one is a little bit more dicey because it's in the summer. So. Yeah, I'm not certain I want to commit to that. 
Although it would be cool to take an Alaska cruise and all that. And I do love my family, and I don't see them enough. Alrighty. It was Ben Drake's idea. Credit where credit is due. Alright, so let's see what color this makes. We're going to do a half and half. Half and half black and orange, um, which is the basic component of brown, right? So that's what we're doing. Since I never remember what my mixes are from moment to moment on this model, but I'm pretty sure that I can find what I need. All right, so we're very orange, so we want to add a little bit more black there. Or, in this case, dungeon gray, which is the closest thing we have to black. Yeah, like, David and I would like to get, like, when we get over to Europe, I want to go to the Louvre, so France is definitely in there, and then maybe Italy. We have to decide, like how much time we want to commit he's got vacation and as long as i get my patreon stuff done we can go we can schedule it but we'll see so now i want a little bit of red in there i think and a little bit more gray so a little bit more of our dark because i'm just trying to 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 go closer and closer now this is starting to look a little greenish and the reason is that our orange has a lot of yellow in it right so it's you know orange necessarily is a mix of red and yellow so sometimes you'll, that yellow, if that yellow is really strong, you'll see it kind of push, uh, if you're trying to mix a brown, you'll see it trying to push toward a greenish color instead of a warm brown like we've got here. When you've got that, then, uh... <laughs> if we were on the continent, it didn't go to the Louvre, yeah. Well, David and I have this habit of this tradition of going to art museums together, so the Louvre would be the ultimate art museum to go to together. I'm going to add one drop of our kobold's kobold scale, which is a brownish red. And as we mix that in, then we start getting much closer to a nice warm brown, the brown that we had in the first place. So really, I mean, mixing, kind of use your gut. Once you know that a brown is just a muted or darkened orange, you can work with that. You can really pick up any orange, mix some, you know, dark gray or black or whatever into it or dark brown for that matter and create your own custom brown that works with what you're painting so that's pretty good but i think we need a little bit darker and then remember what we were doing also we mixed our own bone color last time also for his belt for the bone there and i want that i decided i would like that i love the warm color and i want it on his loincloth i'm going to dirty it up around the edges but i still want it so i'm going to go there i want to repeat that color i decided because i really really like it hey tashi um, Pendrake, I went to two when I was there. The Actually, the Honolulu Museum of Art is very good. It has an excellent Asian collection, um, which makes sense, right? As you have a lot of um, Chinese and Japanese and other Asian immigrants to Hawaii over the past hundred years. So it was it's actually an excellent, excellent museum. It's a small one, but it's excellent. And then there's another one that I didn't get to, but that David did in on, uh, on Oahu in Honolulu. And there's got to be some cool ones in the Big Island. I just, you know, haven't looked up stuff yet. So as we are mixing our cream color, remember cream is just a light yellow with a little bit of brown in it. So we're going to use a couple drops of our closest thing to yellow, which is ochre skin. Hey, Daphne, thanks for the resub. Yeah, it's nice when you were, yeah, empty nesters, right? That's the good part is you can take off without worrying as much. I mean, I miss Kiri a lot, but it will mean that David and I actually get to get some travel in without worrying about a puppy for the next year or two. Which for me, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've had animals for 27 years with like one six month break in there after my old cat died and then I moved down to Texas. And uh, I, it would be nice, like, because I worry about them so much when I leave home. I, I just do. I'm a worrier about my animals. Everything else, I don't care about a house or whatever I've got going on. But the animals, I worry about. So it would be nice to be able to travel, you know, possibly, you know, really for the first time in my life since I was a kid. Um, to be nice to be able to travel without worrying about animals being boarded or having pet sitters that might have problems or anything like that. Hey, Dandercles with the resub. Eight months on an eight-month streak. He has never let it fall. Very, very good. So let's see here. So I think I went with a fair bit of orange on this cream color. So right now what I have is I've just got our ogre skin with our vampiric mist, which is our closest color to white. So what I'm doing here, to reiterate for those who have not been following along on Rock Troll all these times, 
um, is I am using only the Dungeon Dwellers colors with like just one or two exceptions. So like the shading is black indigo on his green and on his purple. But the, um, the rest of this model is painted with the uh, Dungeon Dwellers box sets. So that is... One second. Let me get my boxes. You can buy them singly as well. But since I had them and since they are an interesting and versatile mixture of colors... Dungeon Dwellers, 9461, all the way through. And then you've got your Troll and your Orc and your Goblin Skin, Kobold, Ogre, and Knoll. And this gives you a very good selection. The only thing you don't have in this is a blue, which is why I threw some black indigo on there. Hey, hello, hello. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so speaking of which, I need my black indigo. Where are you, black indigo? Where are you? There it is. Soon to be released in Kickstarter. Um, if you don't have Dungeon Gray, you could you could uh, substitute Carbon Gray from the Kickstarter chibi. So if you've got the last Bones 4 Kickstarter, Carbon Gray was in that uh, triad with Moon Moon and Misty. <laughs> moon Moon Blue. And uh, that's fine. It's just uh, what I'm what I'm really getting at here, though, guys, is that if you have a good selection of colors, even if they're muted, even if your orange is goblin skin, even if your red is kobold scale, you can still uh, mix and create a bunch of vibrant colors and really get a model that looks awesome um, just by holding yourself kind of to that palette and trying to mix the tones that you need. Uh, and it, it can be fun. It can be a fun exercise. It'll make you mix a bit so you get practice with that. And what happens when you use a limited palette like that to pull, you know, to mix everything on your model is that it, it looks like it all belongs together. All the colors tend to go together. Like there is no brown that I could mix here probably that would not go well with the orange and the green and the purple just because I'm using the same colors to create it as I'm using for everything else. So you missed four. Uh, it's 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 uh, actually uh, moonstone blue. It's uh, it's stones mist and stones or or something sky and stone triad where it's got the foggy gray. Sorry, not misty gray, foggy gray, um, carbon gray, and uh, moonstone moonstone blue, which is a very pale uh, grayish blue, which is a great color uh, in general. I like it as an undertone for cold whites, things like that. But yes, um, any dark gray. Stormy isn't quite dark enough because remember what you're using dungeon as your sit-in for is you're using this as a sit-in for a black usually. Um, so you're, you're mixing browns with it, for example. You're muting colors with it. So you do want a, a moderately dark gray. I don't know if Stormy's quite there. But carbon gray is a true charcoal gray. It's a color that I had wanted in the line for forever. So go out there and buy it, dang it. Otherwise, Ron will cancel it or Ed will or somebody will. Um, I want a warmer, uh, if I look at my bone color that I did last time on his hip, it definitely isn't too yellow. It's got a lot of brown in it. So I'm going to take my goblin skin color, the orange, and I'm going to add it to that pale yellow that I had mixed to see if that shifts it enough toward my bone color. Because I want to kind of duplicate that color for my, uh, loincloth. So that's going to get me a little closer probably still needs some brown so I'm going to actually mix the brown in here and that's going to get me really close now I just need to add more white or just use that as the base coat and then go up from there so using my pre-mixed brown plus some yellow and orange is giving me a very warm kind of beige color and that's a good base for uh moon moon and foggy <laughs> moon moon technically being the husky meme should be should be a wolf and a uh rabbit Kind of like the fox and the bunny in uh, that one uh, movie lately. Ah. <laughs> Just check in. Check in, check in, check in. Yeah. Check in to make sure I'm not missing anything. All right, so this, uh, this orangey color is maybe a little orangier than a lot of what we have here, but it's close to this color up here. So I'm going to go for it. Putting it over the top of my black indigo that I've done on this loincloth will probably result in muting it down just a little bit anyway, as this counts as underpainting. It may make it a little bit greenish looking, in which case I'll have to tackle that when I get there. But I 
Yeah, a lot of people's groups are geographically scattered. I know people on my Discord were um, also like joining up to, to to be a trio, and they wondered about that as well. All right, so let's get this kind of locked in. And I am going to use some of this brown just a little bit to kind of mix in toward the top. I want to leave some of the blue indigo in the shadows or the black indigo in the shadows. I can always reintroduce that as well. But if I just darken my uh, bones straight off, then that's going to help me in general. <laughs> Photographs submit separate and submitted at the same time. Hey, Bob and Julie, how's it going? We're painting troll loincloth. I know, so exciting. So exciting. And at the beginning of the stream, I talked about basing a little bit. Rambled on about basing. I ramble on very well. It's one of my main talents. So I decided I wanted the loincloth to be a lot like the bone color that I got over here. So I'm starting off with a color that's close to it and then I'll adjust it a bit. But I do want to leave that little bit of black indigo. I also want to leave some brown in the shadows because I want it to be a very dirty loincloth because it kind of makes sense. It's a bit ragged. I also don't want, um, I want to leave some black indigo in there to separate out this creamy color from the brown fur. Oh, good. Bob and Julie on the crow's nest. Everybody show up. Even though my D&D &D stream will also go, you should all show up to Michael's stream. And uh, be sure to, I'm sure he'll have some great questions for Bob and Julie. Some great, uh... it'll be some good chat, everybody. You should not miss it. There, so I'm putting some of the brown in, you can see, to, to just add the shadows. This is still all wet, so I'm, as I do it, it's a little bit wet blending. <laughs> Gotta remember how to talk. I know, right? Happily, David and I talk a lot, so we're still, uh, we're still able to converse hypothetically. And I always talk to people here on stream, so, you know, you guys help me stay in practice talking to actual people, even if we are not currently next to each other. There we go. So I'm darkening down those folds just a little bit with my brown. Oh yeah, it's the what's your werewolf mate name? Yep, because there's a random name generator for werewolf characters. Everybody is just uh, co-opted it, and it was the fun. It was the meme was always that you could get moon in both columns, so you could actually get moon moon, which everybody figured was just the the really dumb werewolf who didn't really know how to wolf, because only that kind of werewolf would have that name. <laughs> so then it became a meme. Yep, it's an old meme, but still funny. As are, you know, if you look up Moon Moon memes, there's a lot of wolf and husky funny pictures with good captions, so. All right, so I'm kind of blocking in more of this now, and I'm, now that I've got my shading kind of in. I remember it because I was a Werewolf the Apocalypse player, so of course the Werewolf uh, random name generation uh, tables were totally useful, no Metsy. Well, and GM, to be honest. It's only my favorite RPG of all time. Alrighty, so now we've got some nice highlights coming up on there. Yes, yes, and, and wow. Wow, of course, it has lots of bows to various memes. So, all right, I'm going to actually create a puddle of uh, vampiric mist and add a bit of my, uh, my beige color to it so that I can get some highlights. Memes are forever. I mean, come on, it's on the internet. Once it's on the internet, it's there forever, for better or for worse. David saw a funny one this morning. There's a comic. I don't know where he found it. He, he just kind of scrolls through the things that people post up on his work groups, I think. Um, but it's like uh, 10 years from now is what it says. 
it starts out with that and it's like 10 years from now you'll reach out and find a mask in your you know you'll put on your jacket and put your finger hand in a pocket and you'll you'll find a mask and you'll think wow that was a really crazy or weird year and then you'll go and you'll grab your machete and you'll go out and kill zombie you know zombie raiders in the wastelands or something like that right it, essentially applying uh in the last frame that that is even weirder it's just you still think 2020 was a weird year <laughs> I really hope we're not all killing like zombie raiders in the wastelands like 10 years from now. Like I really hope that the government and and the various pharma companies can can help us before we get to that point. Oh, shorthand, yeah, dragon. I bet. Yeah, I think the Vex Needle is kind of what makes it unique, Amy. If I remember my, um, what, uh, Aaron, you know, was saying once upon a time. Lovejoy. Uh, and so it would make sense you could not shift those into another Badger airbrush. Since they would want to keep what is unique, unique. All right, so I mixed in some vampiric mist and that's giving me a nice, beautiful, warm cream color. So just pretty much taking the, a brush full of this and adding it to a couple drops of vampiric mist to lighten it up. I've got a really nice warm set of browns now and from here I can pretty much create anything I want. I can get all this leather and fur highlighted. I'll probably, I'll add a little bit more orange to my brown to make a, make a different sort of highlight for the fur pelt here. But first, we will uh, we will do our cloth and add a little water to that cream color. Do -do -do. If you don't know how the Vex works, you should. I think we still have stuff up on our YouTube that Lovejoy did, don't we? And and Michael maybe. Uh, isn't Lovejoy doing a Vex Hour or something for us, uh, Justin? Like, isn't that a new show for some reason? I thought. thought it was. thought Aaron was going to be doing a special thing. What do you think, John? John, do you know? Yeah, House of Vex. Thank you, D. Clearman with the win. Yes, so House of Vex, um, I believe, is starting up. Periodic Fridays. Yes. Thank you, Dragon Eye. And David. Um, so that is going to be Aaron Lovejoy essentially running the Vex through its paces, I believe, on various projects. So if you do not know why the Vex is different or how it is different or why it is so cool, you should watch one of those. One Friday a month. Thank you. Aaron is the expert since he's the one that was working. Him and him and I think he and one other person were working with Badger on this. Uh, I think Matthew Fontaine was involved. There were a couple of like big name painters who were very heavy into the airbrush who were involved in uh, the the initial concepting of the Vex and kind of working with Badger till. Tell them, you know, unless you do something unique where we won't use it, you know, it's got to be, it's got to have something to, that's better than my other airbrushes, stuff like that. Yeah, and without like removing something else to Pendrake, it's, it, there's a lot. I mean, if you're, if you're into airbrushing, I think, I don't remember, it did sound like it definitely made it easier to switch out the needles which is nice. But yeah, ask Aaron. He will tell you. Tune in to House of Vex when it occurs. It should go up on our schedule when it is going to occur. So there we go. So we've got our uh, our blend cloth uh, bring, bringing it up. It's a little bit more yellow than the bone. So now I have to ask myself, do I want to change that a little bit? Because um, I want the bone and the loincloth to work together. So if I feel like it's not working, then I have to glaze it possibly with a little bit more orangey color. 
to bring it down because right now it is very yellow. I probably need to add a little brown to my orange. So I need to uh, create a color based off of my previous colors to knock down the yellow value on that and make it closer to this. Because you can see in the, you can see probably that this is more of a cream and brown and this has definitely got some yellowish tones. So uh, the same nozzle works with both, ne both needles. You don't have to take the tip off or whatever. Yeah, I have no airbrush um, finesse whatsoever. So maybe one of these days. I, I, I seem to want to push myself in different directions right now. So it's all. Yeah, there is, there is. And I could leave it yellow, but that would imply bad things. <laughs> so I'm just going to mix. I'm going to create a glaze that's uh, got a bit more. It's based off of this color, but it's got a bit more brown added into it. And what I'm trying to do is add more of the color that I see on my uh, bone canteen here and downplay that yellow. So, because I want those colors to be close to each other because I, I want that synergy. I want to repeat the color around the model. Right now, the color isn't quite, the colors aren't as close as I would like them to be. So I'm going to do this glaze of this kind of brownish orange, uh, which is a lot, a very similar color to the, what's at the top of this canteen here. And I'm going to uh, see how that does. So I'm going to take my glaze and I'm going to paint it quickly over. I'm not really going to pay attention to the shadows so much as I am the highlights because the highlights are what's going yellow. But if I get stuff in the, sh in the shadow, that's fine. And then I'm going to quick rinse, rinse out my brush. And I'm going to bring it back. And because it's a glaze, we're going to wick off all the excess fluid. So uh, after I um, rinse out my brush and I squeeze the water out of it, it is ready to pick up more water so I can bring it in here to pull the excess fluid off of these areas. Cause you don't want, it's gonna dry like coffee rings. It's, uh, if we don't, it's too thin. A glaze just cannot be left on the middle mini. You just wanna put a thin layer on and let it dry. So that's progressing. I still have a little bit of yellow, but then it occurred, it occurs to me the other way to deal with this is to cover up that yellow with another highlight. So let us do that. Let us create an additional highlight We'll do another couple drops of Vampiric Mist because that's our closest color to white in this set. And then I'm going to add one brush full of the yellow color that I'm not as into just to keep it in the same family. Then I'm going to add a brush full of the brown. So I'm essentially going to create um, another highlight that's a bit more amenable to what I wanted. And I'm going to try to maybe I'll add a little bit more yellow. I don't want to go too far in the other direction or it won't look good. So, but I do want to get it closer to what I see on the other side. So here I've got this kind of biscotti, pale biscotti color that I've got. And I'm going to try to cover up some of my yellow, yellowish white with that probably not toward the edges. I'll probably see if I can get it to kind of go in here. And if I can cover up enough of this yellow, it's going to shift the whole color. And I also need to keep an eye on my browns, make sure that I still have where I want that, that where I want it. Um, that's already starting to shift it a little bit. I do need to add some white to, or some water to this to thin it down, or I'm going to leave lots of brush strokes. And cover up a lot of the yellow with some of this less yellowy off white. And this should work. to bring it closer to my bone over there. Now I still have a lot of yellow back in here, so it may not work as, as expediently as I would wish. I may need to work on, make sure that I've covered over a bunch of the yellow. If I really want to get rid of it. So that's getting there. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely shifting it a little closer to where I want it. So 
Now I do also want to kind of stipple some gunk and uh, mud and crap onto the bottom of this so that you can see some, some dirtiness. Really weathering effects for the edges of, of cloaks are, are just this easy. Like if you want to introduce dirt and dust, just grab yourself a handy brown and go to town. Um, I like to use driftwood brown for really like road dust that is dried on the cape. Um, you could use a more medium brown like this one that I've mixed here uh, if you want to do more of a, a wet, muddy kind of look. more of this on my brush and you're generally using kind of a stippling stroke you're making it more um, heavy toward the bottom then put some speckles in there as it goes up the cloth so that it looks like you know he's been kneeling in the muck and then he stands up and it's all dirty like so and that also will downplay the yellow color a bit because now we've added more brown to take away from that color. It's getting around to the point where I want it. I still feel like I want it just a little bit more orange. But I may drop it and work on uh, the rest of the leather first. And then you can also stipple another layer of the brown on if you want it to be darker toward the bottom where it would have more mud caked on. There. So now that looks uh, pretty flea-bitten, pretty, uh, pretty darn grungy. Nobody would want to touch that loin cloth now. I do feel like I do need a little more orange. I'm going to grab some of my goblin skin, and I might just glaze with it straight up. Just do a couple of dots of orange because I'm probably going to turn that into a highlight for my uh, brown as well. Eh, it's close. You know what? It just needs this color. Like it needs a little bit of that color, which I think is going to be this color mixed with this color in a glaze. So add some water. Sometimes I will build a spot glaze just a tiny little bit if I just have. If I just want it in a couple areas, then I'll just do a real quick one. I think that's pretty good. Still feel like I'm not quite orange enough. Who knew? It's not easy being orange. There. That's a little bit better. Now that's, yeah, now that's reading better. I needed that little extra bunch of orange to really make it line up. Now it looks nice and dirty and awful, like a troll loincloth really should look. Troll is now proud of his loincloth. It was way too clean before. There. There we go. Great. Now we'll mix a color for our uh, fur highlight. We'll go up a little bit orangey. Cave tigers, right? That's what we're looking at. Cave tigers, indeed. So I'm going to add a brush full of, again, now I'm mixing colors I've already mixed, and I'm mixing them in to make this uh, burnt orange highlight for this brown. Because, you know, why not use it, the colors you've got already, it'll make everything go together well. So I want to make sure I've got enough of my brown in there. And then I want to add in some lighter colors so that it makes a good highlight. That looks like a pretty good burnt orange. So that's mostly goblin skin with a touch of this brown and a touch of these paler colors, which are, you know, all mixed together at this point. Everything goes together. And uh, I think I want some black indigo. I want to thin down my brown just a little bit because I'm going to need it. If I need to reintroduce my base color, I want to thin down the orange just a tiny tad. Not a lot, because I actually want this orange to um, to be pretty strong, because I'm going to want to suggest that fur texture. And then I need my black indigo, finally, because...
because the shadows on that loin cloth are black indigo. So let's throw a totally different color into the mix. Not much chat today. You guys all working? Oh, I lost my big round base of doom over here. Don't want to lose that. But yeah, we're totally going to finish out trolley today, and then we'll just deal with this basing. We'll probably spend one day sculpting the basing and one day painting the basing. And then maybe, you know, we might do the water effects at the same time as the paint. We'll see. I'm going to add some water to this uh, black indigo, which is such a pretty dark color. It is. See if I can get this base to cover up enough of the palette. Pretty color. And I need it thinner than that, though, because otherwise it's going to totally overwhelm the brown. There we go. You really, at this point, I'm just, because this is a totally different color that I'm using to shade the brown with, um, I'm uh, thinning it a lot. So when you're doing that, when you're, when you're shading one color with another and they're very different colors, uh, do thin down, the, especially if it's a very potent thing, like a dark blue or a dark purple or like this is, you know, dark indigo. Um, you want to thin it down because you want the shadow, but you don't want the color to be really, really strong. We don't want the purple shadows in his loincloth or his, you know, fur piece um, jumping out at us. We want them to just shade and give us a little bit more complexity. <sighs> yeah, everybody's, everybody's busy at work. David, I had a busy morning too. After lots of days off. Yeah, everybody's working. All right, cool. Well, thanks for listening in and giving us better numbers, guys. Oh, oops. All right, so first of all, I'm going to try to put on some of this orange. Remember the basic rule to highlight, to not do the fur texture until you get your basic lights and darks mapped in. We talked about this in the past with fur texture. It also holds true when you're doing hair. You want to make everything look correct with the lights and darks, and then you want to worry about the texture. So almost paint it starting out as if you're painting cloth. And uh, it's okay to throw a little bit more brown into some of these shadows. That's looking pretty good. You can still see the indigo in there. Yes, everybody on in meetings, on conference calls. Welcome to Tuesday and the week after New Year. Everybody's getting back in the groove, right, guys? Back in the groove. Me too. Me too, working on catching up on the Patreon stuff. Got some good things lined up for the Patreon this uh, this month. Not that I don't always have good things lined up for the Patreon, but you know. All right, so I feel like I did lose my black indigo shadow between the fur and the loincloth a little bit, so I do want to bring that back in. Oh, yeah, don't worry about it, Mathophile. If you're struggling with code, don't pay any attention to me. Code is, de is the devil, right? Keep your brain where it needs to be. Don't pay attention to me and my silly black indigo. I'm just kind of dragging my black indigo out a little bit into the surrounding area and I'll blend it in with a little bit of my brown to make it not as indigo-y. There we go. That's a little bit better. Yeah, I've gotten, I've, I want that dark shadow between the two. I want to, especially because I'm using a lot of the same brown, I want to really differentiate between these two surfaces. And doing a heavier, colder shadow is one way we can do that. Boom. And then 
just take that down there. Sweet. Okay, good. Debugging. Ook. Sorry, guys. Wow, lots of you struggling with coding. Oh, yes. Tax stuff. Yeah, I was looking at my tax stuff yesterday. Yeah, Dave is going to be doing my taxes this year. It's a, it's a bonus for Reaper employees to have Dave do your taxes. So, Dave will be tackling my taxes. I need to get him my stuff. Alrighty, let's see here now. Getting my orange, my burnt orange. Let's see if it's a little bit. I put it on already here, and I'm going to see if I need a little bit more. Yeah, it's, uh, I can definitely lighten up the top here. And then I'm going to have to build a lighter color still to bring out the fur texture. I think this would probably have a little bit more light. Now I'm going to hit the play, the pieces that I think are kind of like maybe catching a little bit of the light. And then we'll mix us, mix us a further highlight to pick out this fur, really pick out the fur texture. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Um, it's a personal choice, Mathophile. What I typically do is if I'm looking for a very natural shadow, I'm going to use more brown liner. Um, gray liner I actually don't use for lining. I actually use it for shading steel and silver NMM because it's a little more transparent than other uh, paints because it's a liner. Uh, you can get that black to white gradient a little bit easier in my experience. So I, I don't use gray liner for lining. I actually use it for the other. If I want a natural shadow... Um, I'm going to go with brown liner. If I want something that's a bit more uh, punchy, like I really want a cold shadow on something, I would use blue liner. It really varies. Uh, I've got, let me see, I used brown liner on Sphinxy. I'm trying to remember if I used blue liner on anything. I don't think I've got anything currently that I was lining with blue. But sometimes I'll use blue liner mathophile if like I'm doing something like Zari here where she's got a lot of red and I'm taking a lot of it up to orangey. Um, Zari is a good subject for blue liner just because it, it tends to work really well with reds. So I will often do that. I'm also using a color that's very similar to put blue, blue black highlights on her black leather. So using blue liner for her makes a lot of sense because the blue sets off the warm tones of her skin and also the reds, and it works with all of this blue-black leather. So that's an example of when I would use blue liner. Um, any model that I'm doing a lot of cool, cold shading with, and, and that will depend just on the style of what I'm working on, right? Um, then I use blue. I use blue liner itself as a color also, almost more often than I use it as a liner. Uh, because I like adding white to it. I like the blue-gray color that I get. So I use that a lot. <sighs> More code. More code. All right, so now I'm going to take our happy orangey color that I've been using, and I'm going to put it a brush full of it over in a new, new well. Now you guys see why I like this 28 well palette. I can just essentially keep extrapolating my mixes. And... Uh, creating from what I've already created uh, just by grabbing a little bit of this or that to try to bring this color up. I want a lighter color now. I'm probably going to add just a tiny bit of vampiric mist. I may add a tiny bit of ogre skin as well because I kind of want, and I mean tiny, like I'm not even adding a full drop. I just kind of touched it to the side there. And uh, I'm just, I'm actually going to mix this up first and then see if I need any ogre skin or if this is a good light. I think it does need just a tiny bit of warmth. When you need a tiny bit of a color, you can always just kind of squeeze it out and catch it on the end of your brush. If you like want to try mixing a little bit, but you don't want a lot. And if it's a color you don't think you're going to have to repeat, although you certainly could still repeat this, but... I just want a little bit of warmth to it. Since his skin is uh, highlighting yellowy, um, I just want a little bit more warmth on this brown. So I'm going to go for that way. 
let me get this palette out of the way and this is the color we're going to use so but that's more of a that's actually a, a really close to 9111 burnt orange for those of you who always wondered like how the heck do you use burnt orange why would you bother because it's sort of it's an ugly color or whatever um burnt orange is really useful for highlighting browns guys really really useful for that so if you don't want to mix it like i just did um orange brown which is 9201 and burnt orange 9111 should be on your list if you are looking to highlight browns if you don't want to do a lot of mixing if you like to mix then uh, feel free to do what i have done and create a brown and then uh, iterate upon it so now i'm going to add a little bit of texture i'm going to try to catch the strands of fur where i can see them since they've been sculpted pretty well it's not too hard to uh, follow where they are this it is a bit clumpy here and there and that's i mean it is a troll's matted pelt so it's certainly not being kept in good order But, you know, if, if it's a little muddy, if, if you're not sure where the strands are, just kind of, you know, generalize. So we've got a nice highlight up there on the top now. Chris, the easiest way is just to start with two colors and the most, uh, the most else you add would be like white or black, depending on if you're creating a shadow or a highlight. So if you only ever work with two colors, then you're going to be able to reproduce it, especially when you're working on a well palette where you can drop a certain number of drops. Like that's what I recommend. That's a lot of why I recommend learning to use a well palette to beginning painters um, or people who are trying to improve just their, their knowledge and ability with painting is that it allows you to do those mixes. And then it's very easy to just keep a note. Like, uh, where's my notes? I don't know. I don't have one right around here, but I, essentially when I do a, a model, when I'm mixing two colors, I'll just make a note of it, four to one, tan skin to white or whatever. And then I'll just keep that sticky note with the model. Um, that way I know what my base mix is. And if I know that I only ever do something, I only ever start there and then add more white to it, I can always match the color. Also keep in mind that you don't need to be perfect on matching. Like as long as you're close enough, you're good. Like I didn't perfectly match the loincloth color here to the bone color, but it's close enough. So it's working. Um, because I knew roughly what colors I used. I knew that I was using the brown that I mixed, and then I knew that I was using a little bit of yellow and a little bit of white. And so I was able to get close enough. I mean, people aren't going to like, unless it's really different, people aren't going to notice if it's just a little bit different. Especially if you keep in like a, a note that, hey, I used a blue liner to shade this. And so even if the base color is a little off, if the shadow is the same and the highlights look close, people won't notice that it's off. And you shouldn't sweat it too much about that. And it's different if you're trying to, to do the troll here. But even then, like, I have even varied the color on this troll a little bit. And it's, like, really hard to even notice. Like, I mixed different highlights on different parts of this troll. Absolutely. So don't sweat it. Don't let it scare you, essentially, is what it comes down to. Yeah, I'm glad that the your wife's having uh, getting good mileage out of it, Mathophile. I think both palettes are useful. And uh, once you have a feel for paint consistency and color mixing, then you may well get more mileage out of a uh, wet palette because then you'll have the the gut knowledge to judge your paint consistency by the brushful, right? And, uh, and take advantage of the looseness of style that the wet palette gives you. But if you if you're starting off with the wet palette and you have no consciousness of, you know, the uh, the thinness or thickness of paint or how much to load your brush or, or, you know, for each effect or for for different techniques. I think that that a lot of people struggle with the wet palette for that reason, because they just don't have that gut knowledge yet of how to manipulate their paint. So I think that starting with the well palette helps to give you that helps to make it a little easier to mix and a little easier to figure out paint consistency and then when you've got it you can work it i mean i can switch to a wet palette and it will annoy me but i will be able to do all of the effects that i would like to do with it right um my biggest problem with the wet palette is that i tend to mix up colors and want them to stay open for a long time like in big puddles and the wet palette won't do that for me it'll it'll keep thicker you know, blobs of color together. Um, but it won't let me mix like as much necessarily uh, unless I really commit and put a lot of paint blobs onto my palette. Um, 
yeah, so you know, it 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 each palette, just like each type of brush, reinforces and enables different painting styles. And so using both and getting a feel for both, um, and for for a bunch of different brushes, a bunch of different brush shapes, um, you know, and, and even different paint lines, this can all help you guys become more expert painters and uh free up free you up to do all sorts of effects that you want to try so sure no problem chris i like to encourage people because i i myself you know held off trying new things for many years out of you know just kind of a fear that i was going to screw it up just various stuff not even painting but other stuff too and uh I, I just end up feeling like I wasted a lot of time when really it wasn't all that, you know, wasn't all that scary in the first place. Once I actually tried it, it's like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Oh, I didn't match the color. So what do you do then? Well, I guess I try again. Well, that wasn't hard, was it? <laughs> you know? So it's like, just uh, don't let your subconscious mind trick you into not trying stuff. Always play. If you must, get a model that doesn't require you to match stuff, like a demonic model or something like a troll where he could be regrowing different parts of himself, right? Um, and then it'll make you not sweat as much about matching colors and you can play. But in general with mixing, I do tell people when you're starting out with mixing, just make sure that you're keeping to like two colors. Two colors plus white. And, and then those two colors make a note on a sticky pad or, or in a journal. A lot of people keep a painting journal. Um, where they note the model and they note the colors they're using and in what ratios. And then from then on, it's like easy. The other thing I do, Chris, to help enable my mixing style is I always use um, like four to one or four to two ratios. So even if I forget to write it down, I know that if I keep in my basic, um, you know, my basic ratios that I always tend to fall back on, I'm going to be able to match it or close enough. So like if I always reach for pure white to make my highlights, then I'm always going to be able to make my highlights. If I always reach for, you know, if I always start out with a four to one mix, then chances are if I start with a four to one mix, I'm going to be okay. Right. So, so creating some habits on how you build your mixes also can give you, can make it easier for you to reproduce stuff because you always know that, well, I always use this and I always do this. And usually I'm mixing a four to two, so I'm going to just mix a four to two. Oh, look, that looks really close. It's that kind of thing. My habits, my painting habits serve me pretty well. So I got a little too light, I think, on this fur down here. So I'm going to glaze it down a little bit with brown. You know, don't... Okay, so people people talk to me about this a lot lately. I'm hearing a lot of this, that I need to paint faster. Why? Why do you need to paint faster? <laughs> like, what is your, like, uh, it's like people who are learning, when you're learning a new technique, guys, you will be slow. I am abysmally slow right now learning a new technique on faces on a bus that I'm working on. I am not berating myself for being slow. Would it be nice if I could paint faster and get more done? Sure. Is it going to break me if I don't get it done super fast? No. And it, honestly, if I wanted it to get it done faster, I wouldn't be trying new things, right, on this model. I would be going back to my old style and just quickly painting it. So always kind of remember, um, you know, if you want to paint something fast, don't, don't expect to be that fast if you're trying to learn new things. It's just it takes time. It does take time. It takes time to do a good paint job. Look at how many weeks we've spent on Troll. He looks fantastic now. I'm super happy with him. I wouldn't go back and give up any of those weeks for sure. And I'm not going to berate myself for not painting him fast enough. What is fast enough anyway? Are you enjoying yourself? Are you learning? Good. Perfect. Keep at it. Yeah, and don't worry about the shelf and shit of shelf of same. Like, okay, what I do is I pack it away in the closet. If I start feeling overwhelmed by the shelf over here, I start packing stuff away that I know I'm not going to work on right away. I reduce my clutter. Out of sight, out of mind. Like, it does. It, you Nobody cares except you. Nobody cares except you. Like, if you're, and if you're painting for a game, well, then get an airbrush or get a big brush and just get used to, like, you know, faster paint jobs. Yeah. Yes. Chibi has it. Hobbies are supposed to be relaxing and fun. Exactly. Thanks, Batusai. 
Yeah, this is Troll. He's almost done now. I just have to finish up his leather here. We're just working on his cloth a little bit. I'm pretty happy with the pelt now and with the loincloth. Um, so now I just need to get this leather. And then uh, I think his eyes are going to be orange. I need to decide. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I like the crystals too. I mean, a lot of them are done very fast. It's just these bigger ones that I spent some more time on. So those are the ones that stick out and grab your eyes. But a lot of the little guys here, they're just really fast. And uh, if you look on our Reaper YouTube, you can find all the videos for this guy. Uh, you just need to look at... You can look at either his item number, search by either his item number or his name, and Justin should have used one or the other. Um, eventually, they're going to be uh, putting, you know, these together into collections, but right now, that's we don't have the time. So, yeah. But yeah, I'm glad that this is inspiring you. Like, that's my goal, guys. That In my Patreon and here, um, like, that's why I teach, is to is to get you excited and to, and to help you overcome the fear, right? Because there's this fear of failure that we've got. And we and, and just, like, kick it to the curb. Seriously. Just enjoy yourself. It, it should be a win if you're having fun and relaxing and enjoying your hobby. So, all about it. But, yeah, I totally do the reorg and remove, like, I remove, I just reorged and removed a bunch of stuff to the closet. Now I need to reorganize the closet even and, and do it. So, uh, I thought about yellow and that was my original uh, about to side, but it can be hard to make yellow read when it's so small. Um, I did the white background because I wanted the yellow to show up, but I'll have to use a very orangey yellow for it to read as yellow. When you've got a really light color and you're putting it in a very tiny space, often it's very hard to get that color to pop. Um, so if I do do yellow, I'm probably going to end up shading it with orange anyway, which is why I thought I might just go orange in the first place and highlight it with yellow. That way I get both. Um, but yeah, the basic rule is if you have a tiny little space and it's a very light color, it tends to just read as light. It tends not to read with the actual color. As you enlarge an area, putting down a light color, you're going to see more of that color. This is why, this is why you hear those stories of people buying a light yellow paint at the paint store, going home, putting it on their wall, and suddenly it looks like the brightest yellow ever, is because the more room, it's actually actually a scientific fact, the more area a color takes up, the more you see the intensity of the color. It's the way our eyes function. The bigger it is, the brighter it is. So when you've got, that's converse, it works conversely as well. So when you, the smaller the area is, the, the harder it is to make the color show up. So yeah, yeah. So that's, that's my problem. Like I really, yellow was my original choice because we've got my purple right here, right? So it would make sense. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid that it's just not going to show up very much. So I might do, what I can do along that line is I can choose a very vibrant yellow, one that's really punchy. So like this one, this is, this is a very orange face yellow. As you can see, this is lantern yellow. So it's probably the orangiest yellow that we put out. Um, and it's the most intense uh, orangey yellow that we put out as far as like just brightness. Um, there's marigold yellow too from the Coraline, but it's more orange uh, and a little duller. So I could do this one and that would probably allow me to overcome it a little bit. I may try that. And then if I don't, if it just isn't really showing up as yellow, I may add just a tiny touch of orange. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Oh, you did that? You had to repaint the room, Chris? Yeah. Yeah, it's a thing. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite color books I always recommend is Betty Edwards' uh, Color. Uh, it's a course in mixing colors, but she also starts out by talking about rules like this. She, she will she will mention the rule where the larger the area, the more intense the color looks, you know, and things like that. It's a great book. It's, a, it's actually a fairly small book, um, but it's got fantastic exercises for color theory, for if you want to learn how color changes when you put another color next to it and, and get a feel for that sort of thing. Uh, and she also talks about like the meanings of colors and different, you know, and, and, and all this in, in various cultures and things like that. She's a fantastic little book, Betty Edwards Color. I recommend it. It's one of the two color theory books that I strongly recommend. The other one is Color and Light by James Gurney. Um, and James is the pro who did Dinotopia. Uh, so he's an amazing painter and his color and light book is like a, an eternal classic. That thing's going to be in print forever. Also, if you do buy a James Gurney book and if you want to support him directly, I recommend you buy it off his website. It may be slightly more expensive than buying it off of Amazon. But when I bought direct from his website, he actually gave me a little dinosaur bookmark and signed it and everything. So it drew me a little dinosaur on the front page. Um, so, you know, it's, it's worth buying it from the artist. Just a little plug there. Uh, 
Um, Rex, actually, it's just the pigment you use. There are two yellow pigments. Three, actually. Okay, there are three yellow pigments that tend to be used in miniature and model painting. Um, and uh, they vary. Here, here's, here's some examples of, of the three yellows. Even though these are all mixes of other things, but they have a primary yellow pigment in them, each of these. And that pigment is different. So if you don't see a lot of green yellow in non-hobby lines, it's because it's the least popular. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it. Um, so, like, I think cadmium yellow pale might be a green phase, or, or hue, the hue, not the not the actual cad yellow, since obviously that's not a green phase uh, yellow. So it's, it's cadmium. It's a totally different beast. But um, I don't remember what the green phase yellow looks like in, like, which color it is in a traditional artist line. But these are the, the three yellows that you will see in most miniature painting and hobby lines. You've got yellow ochre. You've got an orange phase yellow, and you've got a green phase yellow. Uh, one second, what we got? Uh, I mean, all you have to do is ask. I'd rather, I mean, I guess we could put them in a Discord command, but, uh, but yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, and lemon yellow tends to be right. So, th so this is more of a green phase yellow, but I hate to call cadmium cadmium yellow itself a green phase yellow so if yellow pale looks greenish it's probably just the way that it shifts or they have shifted it and if you're dealing with a hue then you're not dealing with actual cadmium pigment at all then you're probably dealing with a green phase yellow um the other reason you don't see green phase yellows as often other than that they aren't as popular is that they don't cover as well so rex when you're dealing with house paint or you're dealing with craft paint or something where they're trying to get a little extra coverage on something they will usually go toward an orange phase yellow where the pigment grind is larger and it has a bigger um bigger particle size to block the light so it is has slightly more coverage whereas the green phase yellows are among the weakest pigments um out there uh i did a color theory um pdf in my five dollar tier long long ago i think on pigments I think it's the um, the Paint Mythbusters one. It's from a long time ago in tw early 2019. So if you're on my Patreon, it's patreon.com slash painting big. Um, you might want to go and look that one up. I talk a lot about kind of busting some of the myths that paint companies put out uh, and how paint coverage is really achieved and stuff like that. But anyway, so orange face yellow, slightly more coverage. Yellow ochre is brownish, so it doesn't give you an intense color, but it is really high coverage because the ochres and oxides are some of the biggest pigment grinds, and so they cover really, really well. So one way to get more coverage in a mixed pigment yellow is to add a little bit of ochre or oxide into it. Um, then you've got your green face yellow. This has white in it. It's a highlight. It's a color I love and use a lot for highlighting dark skin tones, um, but it is definitely more green, as you see when you compare it directly to the orange. You can definitely see that it shifts the other direction. And there is a true chromium yellow, which is kind of halfway between orange and green, but with industrial paint pigments colorants, they're giving you either or because they want it to be very easy for you to mix. So they're like, why do you need a middle yellow? Just use this orangey yellow if you're mixing oranges or this greeny yellow if you're mixing greens. Ta-da. <laughs> so, and then if you're mixing browns, yellow browns, use the brownish yellow. So there are three different, three different yellow pigments. They're the primary pigments in these three paints. And there you are. I hope that explains it. But I have found that people prefer orange yellows um, to... Uh, green yellows oh let's see here uh, da, 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 da. oh thanks for the link to my patreon margaret margaret with the patreon link thanks very much we're gonna be doing uh i think i'm gonna be doing a pdf I actually got a request from a patron um about which colors are the highest coverage so i think i'm gonna do a a PDF or a video for the $2 tier on some of like the highest coverage red in MSP, highest coverage yellows, things like that. Should be fun. Uh, all right, cool. We are there. We've got that highlighted. The fur looks great. Now I just need to figure out what I'm highlighting this, uh, this brown with, and I could go with totally different color. I probably should. So I'm going to grab some of my brown, transport it over here, grab some of this color and mix kind of a, kind of a pale biscotti color and use that. It's kind of a washed out. I might go a little more yellowy with it. Let's see. By a little more yellowy, I mean just grab a little bit. You don't need much when you're mixing paint. Yeah, it's warm versus cool. 
Um, I don't know, Francis. I mean, and in general, when I say that, it's not like I'm referring to any studies on the subject. Uh, be aware that's just what I have, I have noticed when people tell me about their favorite yellows. Um, they almost always go with the orange yellow. Like, nobody, nobody ever walks up to me and says they like clear yellow. Like, back in the day when I worked at Games Workshop, clear yellow is essentially bad moon yellow, the old, old bad moon yellow. And that was the just, just a eyeball screaming bright color, right? Everybody hated it, but it still is like the best utilitarian yellow highlighting color. Um, so yeah. Yeah, see, Kroniko, exactly. It's, it's a lovely uh, color for building highlights on any brown or, or uh, orange or, you know, you can even mix it with red um, or even other yellows, right? So it's really, really useful. They, they can be wrecks, but you have to, the thing to remember is not to use them as themselves, is to use them for highlighting. Like I mix them into dark skin tones and use them for highlighting or even regular skin tones with white and use that for highlighting. Um, I tend to highlight up toward warmth because I'm often doing, you know, a natural light, you know, outdoor type of subject. So I need uh, a yellowish white to mimic sunlight. And so that's what I reach for. Um, and if people thought more about light and how it falls on the model, which in, to be fair in Europe, uh, you guys, uh, have those of you who are Europeans, you tend to have a, a far better, um, grasp of that. I, I think because the arts are, are not like a pariah in Europe, like they tend to be here in the States. Um, so maybe you have a little bit of grounding on that, but, uh, when you start thinking about the color of your light and how it affects the colors on your model, like start actually envisioning your model out there in the world and and how things really work with light and physics then you uh then you suddenly have a new appreciation for yellows for pale yellows yeah well and that's just what i said earlier chibi where it's because we tend to be using yellows in small increments and so the uh lighter the color the more it washes out and just looks light um, whereas the, the darker, warmer, orangier yellow is going to look more yellow. Psychology of color. Yeah, that could be out of date or not. I don't know how much it's changed over the years, Nomad Zeke. If it's an old, old book. There are a lot of studies done on how people react to certain colors. I do know that. So I'm going to do some kind of stipply little things, by the way, on this leather, guys. Here, let me get some close. Let me get closer. We'll try to stay in camera view and we'll try to stay in focus. But yeah, there's a lot of psychology being done. A lot of, and yellow is one of those colors that people either like or hate. And I am somebody where yellow is my favorite color. So purple is a close second, but yellow is the first. I do love yellow. It makes me happy. Like yellow makes me happy. I'm going to just darken down the side of this canteen with a little bit of my black indigo. I want to introduce a little bit more of a shadow, a cooler shadow. So I'm darkening that down. That'll help interrupt the uh, leather here and definitely let you see where this leather begins. The problem with psychology of color too, is that you have to look at um, what culture they're dealing with. Uh, right? Because it changes by culture. Like, people will view black or white in very different ways depending on the culture they were raised in. So, all right. So we're going to do this leather and I'm going to kind of do kind of a little stripey. See if I can get it down where I've got very little paint. I might actually need to switch to a small brush. When you're trying to paint really small areas like this and you want to be precise about it, think about switching to a tiny brush. Tiny brush. Orange is the only color you dislike. I don't love it. Um, I seldom paint with it, math mathophile, but I do use a lot of orange as accents. So like my orangey hand here and the oranginess around his face. Um, and I love browns. I love warm browns. So blue is pretty easy to add if you just use it as a shading color. You can always get that cool blue shadow. It'll make your work look um, a little less realistic and a little more you know, have a specific like style. So I'm just kind of putting little brush bits, little tiny. 
and I'm kind of dotting. I'm, I'm making little lines in truth because leather, when it's round, it tends to split uh, top to bottom, like with belts, which if you look at a cracked belt, you're going to see that cracked leather. I do want to add more of the shadow here. So with Troll here, like I'm not looking for realism. I'm looking for a very stylistic, like light and dark approach. So his shadows are very blue. They're the black indigo. Yeah, if you have black hair, blue highlights work really well. That's what um, Zazari here has. Black highlights, blue highlights on the black. All right, so we got that leather coming around. So a lot of these models are actually going a little faster than I anticipated. I'm gonna have to figure out some new minis soon. So you can get, with a tiny brush and uh, really controlled paint, you can get very fine lines. See that? Very fine texture. And people looking at your model may not see it right away, but if they get close, then it's going to become evident. They'll be like, oh, wow, you can, you can paint tiny things. And part of painting tiny things is thin paint and a tiny brush. I'm going to come back on the back here and also shade a bit with my black indigo, again, to bring that cold shadow in, kind of put a line between my... Um, bone canteen here and this leather. If I need more shading here, I need to pop it in now. White has a lot of different, uh, different connotations, but yes, I mean like what uh, Japanese wedding, wedding dresses tend to be what red because of uh, it's a fortune color of fortune, like good fortune. Whereas here in the U.S. it's white. White is innocence and purity. It tends to be the color of the good guys. So I'm just putting little tiny little brush strokes in. Probably nobody will like actually see this, but you know, I know it's there, dang it. If I wanted it to be a little stronger, I would make my paint a little bit lighter. But I'm kind of looking to kind of blend it in. Missed a bit of a mold line there, but I'm not going to sweat it. Yeah, that's good to know, Chibi. Well, then it comes from that, but... Nowadays, you're considered weird if you're... Although I think with repeated marriages now, like if you, you know, if, you're, if it's your second marriage or whatever, you can pretty much get married in whatever you want. I didn't have, I, I got very, in, I had a very informal wedding in my old marriage and uh, my uh, color was burgundy and gold. I never saw the point of buying a gigantic, awesome wedding dress if you can only wear it once. Yeah, I think it's a bone or a tooth. We were, we were trying to figure out what it was before, and it looks like it might be a tooth. But it's cool. If you want it to be a giant garlic bulb, you can make it a giant garlic bulb. But yeah, like, isn't it in Islam where blue is the color to ward off evil spirits? Things like that. You know, so never, like, Sergio talked about this in his class with us. He essentially says, don't overthink me the meaning of colors. What's most important is the meaning of the color in the piece you're painting. Because no, you cannot cover every color meaning for every person who is going to look at your paint job. So at that point, what should be most important to you is the, is the meaning of the color as you, to you, as you are applying it on the figure. And I think that is really the way to do it. Like if you need to get some ideas for diff different colors, then by all means, you know, right? Yes, exactly, Hossie. Red was not a good wedding color for the Starks, that's for sure. I'll have to ask, uh, I could ask Gurm, like, if he, uh, was thinking about Asian weddings when he, or if he didn't, uh, 
Like, he, if, if that's what made him think of a wedding color, and then he thought about the connotations of it, right? I just dropped my tiny brush. I must fetch it. One second. Must get under my desk. I am, like, really dropping brushes this week. Just something I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, right. But there's so many different like marketing. It makes sense to to pay attention to those things in marketing. But when you're painting a piece like an art piece or a, a you know a miniatures um, model, if you're trying to do it, you know, say you're trying to do it for a competition or something, like you really can't cover how everybody's going to interpret a given color. So, and sometimes you may get more points if you go kind of off the rails, you know, off of the usual perceptions with your choice. So. I do think Sergio has a point in that, you know, you need to not write exactly about the file. Purple isn't expensive anymore now. Purple is the new black, along with pink. Oh, no, no. What I really like is that guys seem to, I know, seem to have embraced purple as well. Like, it's it's a good uh, across genders color. I blurfed, so I put some water on it to wipe it off there. Much better. Yeah, when you're marketing to a specific, then of course you must consider your market, right? You must consider the culture that you are marketing to. So it makes sense there would be a color theory for marketers. That's pretty cool. Actually, now that I think about it, you've reminded me when I was in art school, um, there were several marketing and advertising people who were taking the color theory class because it was included in their curriculum. That was a long time ago. I often wonder if anybody from my art school classes like actually ended up doing art <laughs> or if they're all like doing various other things. <laughs> like I wonder, I, I was not close to the most talented person in my art school, right, class. And uh, I often wonder though, if I'm like the only one actually making a living doing art. <laughs> Weirdly, it's easier to do it, I think, in miniature painting than it is in a lot of traditional art forms. Okay, so I'm going to come in with a little bit lighter color here just to kind of bring out those edges. Hello, Jofrick. How's it going? Long time to see. Or long time to chat at any rate. Perhaps you've been lurking. So I like adding... This model is big enough that you can add a little bit of texture here and there. So that's why we've got kind of this like cracking edges uh, color here and we've got the striations on the bone here and you know I'm making some uh, some cracks here as well or the suggestion of them at any rate and I'll highlight this cork just a little bit there that's looking really good. Sweet. I keep seeing the chat room reset and I'm like, oh dear. So on this, now remember, this side of the model is in shadow. So when you, if you put any highlights to the brown over here, you need to remember that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix a bit of my brown with my indigo and use one of these lighter colors mixed into that. It's going to give me almost a purplish uh, pale brown and that's what I'm going to use to highlight a little bit on this side that's in the dark. I think I already did actually something similar to this. I can see a little bit of previous work over here which is why this is standing out but it's like you still need to get a little bit of attention over here because there is some reflected light in this shadow but it is definitely in shadow so you got to watch it and kind of figure out if you're uh if it still looks like it should, like if it still looks real. I'm going to bring in a bunch of black indigo probably underneath the top there. I want it to read colder, but it still needs to read brown. So that's the hard part, right? Because it's cooler over here in the shadow, but it's still this color. So I need to kind of look at that, maybe introduce just a little bit of this brown on the bottom, even though it's warmer, and then cool off everything else a lot. To make it read correctly. Well, actually, I think there's a book or there's something on that mathophile where 
where they did um somebody looked at the uh, like the um the impressionists and who was successful and it pretty much was all the impressionists that signed on to uh, their particular movement those were the people who got promoted those were the people who were in the art shows there might have been other impressionists doing excellent work elsewhere but it was a lot harder for those people to even stay in the eye of the public right and and for their stuff to come down to us as being part of the an important part of the movement right so i mean it really with art it really is history written by the victors um whoever you know if you if you signed on to the promotional engine back in you know whatever the 1800s or early 1900s or god i can never remember when impressionism was a thing but you know if you signed on with the group that was the biggest and the loudest then your work got noticed even if other people were doing work of equal or higher quality so that is certainly true that i mean there are definitely famous art pieces i think that did get the recognition they deserved um i do not believe that all classical art is overrated uh I like I I mean Dali is one obviously I've mentioned him before I went to the Dali museum and seeing his work in person that man had serious painter chops oh my gosh like if anything I think Dali was underrated strangely um I was really impressed by his uh his technical ability and just uh everything all of the everythings the really big paintings they just hit you in the face and you're just like holy crap and then you get closer to it and you see his subtlety in his work that you never see when it's reproduced in a print you're just like whoa so yeah, so there's definitely, yeah, well, and maybe, you know, it, it could have, the thing is the fame, the, the, it was stolen and that got it attention, but then that attention also went, oh, this is actually a pretty cool painting, right? So it couldn't be both ways there and that stolen thing. Like, I haven't seen the Mona Lisa in person. I really would like to. All art Never, never discount a piece of art until you've seen it in person. I will say that. Even the best reproduction of print never captures the spirit of the thing in person. Like Dali taught me that because there was one piece that was in that museum that I absolutely fell in love with. But when I went looking, even in the museum store for a print of it, none of them captured the nuance. None of them could capture the nuance of the oils. Like, and the things that I most like about the piece were really in the print. They just seemed minimized. So whenever you're looking at a reproduction, be it in an art book or anything else, keep in mind that the actual painting probably has uh, beautiful subtleties and nuances that you just can't catch um, looking at that reproduction. So it's easy to look at those pieces and say, oh, this, oh, this is simple. <laughs> and then when you see it up close in person, then you're like, wow. Um, people are doing like pointillist stuff, uh, which is, it can be close. Um, the thing about it, Rex, uh, the thing about taking a 2D style and transposing it onto a 3D style, and I actually talk about this on my Patreon because I did a painting like Frank Frazetta series, um, is that you really need to have the right model for it. So like it, if you look at like for cubism, for example, if I, I'm going to do a cubist miniature. Well, first you have to sculpt a cubist miniature, then you have to paint it, right? So there's some art styles where you may not be able to find a model that works with the art style that you're working on. So impressionism is very loose. It's very fluid. So you almost, it would be difficult. You could certainly paint a model in, in the impressionistic style, but you'd have to find one that lent itself to that looseness. Um, you probably could do some busts. There's some, probably some busts out there that you could do it with. I don't know about, about bigger, about, you know, models like this. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, I always wanted to do a pointillist piece because I was like Surratt. Uh, and I, and pointillism is one thing you certainly can do in miniatures. Oh yeah, Mathophile. Like I've got a whole book on the Sistine Chapel because I'm a Michelangelo freak and um, my brother was lucky enough to get over to see it in person as they were restoring it. Um, but that's, yeah, that's just something where even in reproductions it looks amazing. You just know that when you get there, it's going to be even better. Um, and cultivating, cultivating like, you know, an experience of 2D art will help you in your miniature painting. I mean, it, it gives you, it one, it's great idea, It's great for ideas, right? For, um, for coming up with uh, ideas for color schemes or, you know, maybe doing something light or dark or like, like you were saying earlier, you know, maybe taking impressionism or a different 
technique, uh, school of technique, and trying to see what what you can take from that and apply to miniatures painting. Um, it can all, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's all useful. Like anything that makes you think a little bit outside the box. Like I love Baroque stuff because um, I love the contrast of light and shadow in them. And I've wanted to push that more in my mini painting. So this troll is one time that I decided to push that and I probably need to do it more. Um, but yeah, so looking at different art schools and, and finding paintings, examples of paintings that you really love. Another great one might be, I would almost like to see somebody do a diorama, but if you look at Remington's stuff, his Old West um, paintings, like he has this these great pastel colors almost in the groundwork. And when he first, uh, David's a Remington fan, and so when we went down to, when he came to visit me in Texas, we went to some museums to look at Remington collections in person. And when he first put them out, like the magazines that he submitted the paintings to for, for cover, you know, or whatever, thought that he was making up the colors, like because of the blue of his shadows and the kind of pastel washed out yellows and pinks of the environment. He's like, no, this is what the old West looks like. Try coming out here and actually looking at it. <laughs> so, um, textured oil painting doesn't really work on models. Mathophile. Again, you'd have to have the right figure. Um, like, I think if you had a very simple bust, you might be able to do it for a textured oil paint. Like, um, for example, uh, like this lady. She's so very simple that you could probably get away, but even then the tightness of the hair would defeat you. So again, it's what kind of identify why. The first thing to do when you're trying to think about a style to, to put on a miniature is uh, why. Why does that style exist? Why is there texture in oil paint? Why are they doing it? And is there a miniature that supports that why? So like, for example, a lot of the thicker textured oil paint could be just to build up coverage. In which case, it's not really so much a thing. I mean, you could certainly do it. But, but of course, with acrylics, we don't need that anymore, right? So... But I would go with a larger model. If you're going to build up texture, like texture in the actual paint, I think you need a bigger mini. You might even want to try it on something like action figure sized. Because that gives you the room to work to build up those layers. Because also it's what tools are you using, right? People who build up texture in oil paint usually are using a palette knife. In order to do that on a miniature, you've got to have something big. Yeah, cool, Rex. Yeah, that's for sure, Joe, Joe Ferg. Just go slow. Go slow and take your time and pay attention. I agree. That's how I feel about sculpting. But yeah, I like thinking about, you know, when I'm thinking about a school of art, it's like, well, why did they do this? Why did they want to? What were they trying to bring out? What were they trying to do with it? You know, we have an advantage in that we already are working with 3D subjects, right? We're not trying to reproduce texture on um, a, uh, you know, on a 2D flat canvas. We have, uh, we already have some textures already on our models, right? So, and then you also want to look at scale. The reason I say that textured oils probably would work better on a very large piece is that, think about realism and texture, right? Um, so like these little tiny, like, sure, you could try to put a texture on the skin or on the belt of this troll, but, um, in reality, if you were looking at this troll, would you even be able to see the texture at the scale that this is? Like if you were looking at this troll and he was this size, if I was looking, uh, like he'd be like half a block away and half a block away, could I even see the texture? Probably not. So that's why I say that I think textured oils, if you're going to really go for it, I think they probably would portray better on a very large model. Like a, like my Soldier 76, like a, a, a foot tall, like a 1 6 scale. Yeah, you can do anything. I mean, it's all, it's like sky's the limit, Mathophile. Like, there's so much that hasn't been done or, or that has been done but could be done in a different way on miniatures, you know, with art styles. I mean, even in miniatures, we have different art styles for painting miniatures, so... Thank you for the resub. Sky's clear. That's awesome. Oh, it's 11. 
well, it's time to kind of put this uh, put this to bed. And it's good because I just finished all my texturing on the belt. Look. Oh, no. You know what I forgot? I forgot to paint the back of the loincloth. Ha ha. Bad me. Going to paint it a mixture of brown and black indigo because it's just a shadow. It's just in shadow. It's so in shadow that I didn't even notice that I hadn't painted it. So then it just needs to be that. Don't like blow a bunch of time or energy on things that are on the underside of other things or a backdrop. I'm going to put a little bit of highlighting down toward the bottom just to make it plain that I did actually notice the thing, but that's about it. Oh, good. I'll have to look, Soltor. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm catching up on the Discord. Kiri's passing put me behind on everything, but I am slowly catching up. I caught up on a lot of the Discord yesterday. I'll go take a look. Eh. So what if you do? I mean, in here, it's all in shadow. I'm, like, using a lot of heavy black indigo shadow anyway. So if I accidentally get some more black indigo on the legs or some brown, it's not a big deal. I just, uh... Oh, look, I painted some black indigo on the leg. I grab some water... And I blend in that edge. Ta-da. And now it looks fine. Don't overthink it. Never, never over worry. It, when it really, when it's down in the middle and under things, it doesn't matter. Like it really, really doesn't matter. Paint it dark and be done. Yeah, and if you did, you would do what I, you know, do all the time, which is reach over, get a bunch of water, drop it onto it, scrub with your brush, and you can bring it right up. You just have to pay attention. So that you can spot it right away when you make a blur. Alrighty. So there we go, guys. Look at Trolley. Here, let's back out. Let's back out and look at Trolley from far away. Get some of this other crap out of the way. There we are. Trolley. <laughs> I never use pure black. I tend to use walnut or blue liner or something like that, Joker. Whenever it's an underside. If it's at, like the back of the lung cloth here, this is just like walnut. So there is, oh wait, eyeballs. We forgot the eyeballs. Well, we'll do the eyeballs. Yeah, well, let's, let's try to throw that lantern yellow on there and see if it works. If it doesn't, I'll add some orange. So lantern yellow. And I'll grab some orange. Actually grab some magma red because I have it out and it's a really ready orangey color. So it'll mix in fine. All right. So I've got the eyes already painted in white. I'm going to just grab some of my yellow. Since it's a kind of, since yellows are transparent, it's going to be pretty see-through as it is, but I'm going to put it right over this white. And that does carry as yellow. So that's not bad. If I want to shade it, I'll add a little orange toward the back. When you're doing eyes that are kind of glowy like this, And I tend to like to do monsters with just straight, you know, one color eyes because they look spookier, more bestial. But uh, so if we want to direct his gaze, you can take a little bit of orange and put that toward the back of the eye, having the lighter area to the front. Makes it look like he's looking in a particular direction. Turbo Dork, um, I mean, I just did, actually, I just did a video on color shift paints for the Patreon this month, uh, and I used Turbo Dork, and what I, uh, demonstrated is that you don't need black, you just need a dark color, so, medium to dark color. It actually even will show over a lighter color. And now I'm gonna grab, I'm actually gonna grab some pure white for this, I'm gonna mix it with my yellow and do a kind of a dot spot highlight. But yeah, um, I mean, the color shift paint, if you're going to airbrush it in layers on like a vehicle, definitely uh, do that black base. It'll show up more the darker you go, but you can also use a dark color if you want to. Don't have to use black. Alrighty, I'm going to put a little bit... 
Yeah, if you, uh, I don't know if you're on my Patreon, Daffodori, but if you are, it's what I, I showed um, putting uh, color shift over light and dark paints and kind of underpainting with it. There we go, a little dot of white toward the front. And I pretty much just utilize them as metallics, weird metallics. A little dot of white toward the front there. There. Rawr! Rawr, he says! Rawr! Hey, look, guys, we have a troll. Now we have to do is his facing. Patreon.com slash painting big. I have some free stuff. Also up there. Um, Red Links, I haven't been. Uh, I was trying to get a good photo of Juliana, which is the other one that I finished on stream. We only just kind of went over to this whole finishing models on the stream kind of thing. Um, so it's kind of new, but Juliana will be going to Ron at Reaper, so they'll take a picture of her there and put her up in the gallery. Otherwise, I'm not certain on all of these guys. I, pay, I often take pictures of these and put them up on my Patreon Discord, but, uh, I haven't, often with these, I, I feel like, like, it, I don't think I would put them up on my personal website, um, because they are still, like, a cut below what I can do when I really, uh, go for it, so... I don't know. I don't really uh, have. I haven't taken the time in the past for the one that I did finish. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll start. Yeah, if you want. The, I mean, the nice thing, Batisai, uh, is if you like my teaching style. The nice thing about my Patreon is that I can focus more, and I, I have less. You know, although we focused really well during this stream, but we have. There's less interruptions. There's less questions. I can just straightforward teach. So that's nice. Yeah, you do. Um, if you uh, if you can't figure it out, Red Links, just send me a message and I can send you a link to join. All right, let us wrap it up. Let us uh, recap what we did. We mixed a cream color to match our bone color here for this uh, with some trial and error. We added some dirt and speckled uh, mud and soilage toward the bottom of the loincloth. We highlighted our fur by mixing a burnt orange color from our browns. And we added some texture with lighter browns to our leather to show that it's, there, it's, it's kind of cracked and worn looking. Um, and that's what we did. And we did the eyes. So there we go. And uh, yeah, next time basing. So awesome. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody who just came in. I'm sorry. I'm ending now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like the relaxed approach, too. I mean, obviously, it's less stress for me because I can just kind of take my time and work on everything and integrate everything and answer you guys' questions. So it's really nice. Um, so yeah, there we go, guys. We are done. Who do we have to raid, Justin? Uh, Zambies. We have a Zambi raid. Awesome. I've not seen Zambies for a while. That's great. What is she working on today? Uh, let's see here. If my preview. No oh, problem. Of course I'm say. getting ads. Of course. Uh, we'll just take it as, um, on faith that she's working on something awesome. How about that? All right, you guys. I will I'm see afraid. you tomorrow for Wednesday. Already halfway through the week. Where does the time go? Um, and yeah, we'll be working on cat, the cat girl, the cat folk rogue tomorrow. So, uh, remember Bob and Julie are going to be on crow's nest later. So make sure that you tune in and, uh, I'll also have my D and D game on Twitch today. Have a happy day and I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Thank you guys very much. We'll see you this afternoon.